You are listening to KZYX 90.7 FM Philo, KZYZ 91.5 FM Willits and Ukiah, 88.1 FM Fort Bragg. Altogether, we make up Mendocino County Public Broadcasting member-supported community radio. We also stream live on the web at kzyx.org. Support for KZYX comes from our members and Mendocino Spirits, a proud supporter of public radio. Mendocino Spirits makes locally crafted bourbon, rye, and gin and happily delivers spirits for celebrations and gift giving. Shipping available in California, Arizona, and Kentucky. More information at mendocinospirits.com. Hi, and welcome to Be More Now. My name is Blake Moore, and tonight on Be More Now, I'm going to take us on yet another trip down Poetry Lane. This time I'm going to feature Silent Motif, Conference of the Poets, Part 2, a compilation poetry CD put together by poet Kirk Lumpkin with Berkeley musicians Robert Keller and Paul Mills. Poets you're going to hear tonight include myself, Kirk Lumpkin, Chris Olander, Steve Arnston, Dave Shattuck, and Sarah Murthra. I will also include a few songs written and performed by my dear friend Nymphia off her album Dream Dance. I started this sequence back in January of 2023, so here we are in March, and I just want to keep it going. We're going to hear the rest of that CD, Conference of the Poets by Silent Motif, as well as Dream Dance by Nymphia. Stay tuned, enjoy, and keep listening. Splendor, one. Come and see. The potato vine blossoms grow white on the fence rail. The redwood boughs flex and return on the wind. The early spring rain girds the eaves in pearls. To the beings up above and the creatures down below, I say hello, hello. This is the living Torah that unspools from a point of thrall in my chest, two fingers below the heart. What's to become of me? Take wing, take wing. I've grown old with no wisdom. Take wing, take wing. Flashing, disappearing. The radiance zaps you in the wilderness, finds you there worshiping your losses. Take wing, take wing. The beings the prophet saw had four faces, corresponding to the four levels of existence, matter, soul, spirit, and essence, among which they moved as messengers, declaring, however faintly, a human possibility. Glimpsed 40 years ago, in Muir Woods' reverie, the old growth redwoods breathing, the sky a phantasmagoria of color, and a point fascinating, not terrifying, beyond which all things simply ceased. Come and see, he 
even now, in the midst of my staid life, burst now and again by passion and strife. The radiance zaps me as the dusk sky brightens behind the swaying oak tree. Two, who among you awaits each day the light that shines when the king visits the doe and is declared the king of all kings of the world? Zohar 1-4-A. Twin fawns, almost yearlings, leap from the eucalyptus 20 feet from the guardrail. Their freckled ears alert their heads turned in perfect symmetry, their steady black eyes holding mine. The rising sun backlights the ridge top. Shekinah. And once they know I know, they turn and move with unimaginable gentleness back down the canyon. Six, the wedding. By the whispering of lips, she ascends. A scrub jay squabbles in the alder, the ubiquitous sound of city jackhammers, the old oak's pattern of light and shadow across the field. The Kabbalists say, lift up the genius of this world like the bride at a wedding her long hair flying as the chair rises and falls. Now the groomsmen grab me up as well. Stop holding the chair for dear life, they shout, and soon I'm waving my kippah like a sombrero, holding on to a white handkerchief. We spiral round and round each other to the saxophone horror of the R&B band. Now that she's entered the canopy, she's called Lori. Thirty years later, I'm sitting in a park in Berkeley, remembered ecstasy, calling me to prayer, like the muzzin from a distant minaret. Eleven. Even the tiniest thing in this world depends on another supernal thing appointed over it. Zohar 1, 156b. A pharmacy receipt for Diet Coke and Kleenex. An Arizona commemorative quarter. The universal declaration on the rights of men. The light refracting shards of a broken Mickey's big mouth. Nothing in this world alone, untwinned. Nothing in the other unmoved by our existence. Bird shit on a Prius, your headache transmitting neurons, the talk like sands of Afghanistan, discarded petroleum barrels on the Siberian steppes. All involved in a cosmic pas de deux, a free hydroxyl radical in the bloodstream, a prom photo with the boy carefully cut out, a bit of gristle caught in your teeth. Not some indifferent digital registration above, click for click, but God's mercy overflowing. Burnt trash, fig tree, the ring nebula in Orion. 13. The word flies, ascending and descending, and it is transformed into a heaven. Zohar 1.5a. Come and see how everything that exists carries buried within the longing to return. Pry the truth 
out from under the words. Let it fly free from its earthly tether. The stoic rocks bear up. The animals in the great wheel of their existence barely feel it. But we, at our peril, grab on, grab on, trying to deny the lightness within. Come and see that even as matter encloses us, the Blessed Holy One in His love and loneliness longs to descend, waits eagerly all week for His invitation. Take wing, take wing. The blossoms have appeared on earth. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Come and see. This voice is heard, a voice sculpting, a spoken word, rendering her perfect. Not the chazan, but my own voice, greeting the January clouds, backlit at sundown, dark bars of rain descending out past the gate. Thank you. 
Mining the American. Up on the North Fork, dreams are still mine. Dredge from the river sand and bottom mud. Sucked out from under jumble boulders. Bigger than dreams. Up river, past the aggregate mine. The color ripples in the willows across gravel bars. Four-wheel drive mules roll over. Families take their claim. Scour the bedrock to pick out fault cracks for gold. Naked in the heat. Tent and trailer colonies gather at the bridges. The miners kneel at the river's banks, swirl sand in pans, appraising gold. Up higher, the American runs wild through Boulder Canyon's white water scour. Crags up lovers leap, sever foot trails in giant gap that pick up two miles up river in Green Valley. The gold gathers in the bedrock's fissure and between boulders in the gaps. Dark emerald pool, where there are no trails in your metals' ecstasy. The light roars, cold white rush.
Poppy Manifesto. Sunday came in a postcard of a sprouted desert on the hill, and it was goldering there for us when we cleared our debts and took to our boots. From the valley, we could shield our eyes and just make out something glittering. Rolls of heat over the peak like bales, unstringed and hay-colored. None of our telescopes could itch the details. We prepared for the desert by listening to dooming porch talk about weather patterns disrupting winter. We were curious about the desert, battling the ocean in steamy clashes, cliffs taking no prisoners, tree casualties unnumbered. All preparations complete, we carried apples in case of horses and formed small hiking groups that would communicate by piling rocks, and set out at dusk when the light didn't blind us as much. Our group knew the most. We located travel guides from the last time this happened. Those wanderers made ink from cactus fruit and quills from cactus spines, only we couldn't translate their dialect. The colloquialisms came through, as did their sketches of fauna and flora. The closer we got to an outcropping, the more the weeds looked like wheat. At a distance, everything looks like wheat and the prairie. Everything made us wish we brought mules and yokes and leather tools. At a distance, the waving wheat beckoned to us, even though up close, it was nothing more than jagged sticks. We sent scouts ahead as we approached the desert, low on water and weighing the odds for permanent settlement. The scouts didn't return. The moon pricked its ears at a call. At first, the desert sounded like corduroy pants chuffing against each other, then like waxed envelopes. Then it sounded more like a real desert, night insects. We knew we were getting close when we couldn't mark our passage with rocks. We tramped overland while snakes traced our progress. We entered the desert together, dry-lipped. Nobody stopped to sketch or take notes or measure specimens. We scattered, grazing the golden. What we knew dusted our boots. The desert watched us emerging from what we thought we knew. The desert gathered us in her arms like poppies, our sheen tarnished, almost endangered, clambering hillsides in search of untapped habitat. Ah, yes, indeed. I want to remind you that you're listening to Be More Now. I'm your host, Blake Moore. And what you just heard started off with Broken by Nymphia off of her Dream Dance album. Splendor Excerpts by David Shattuck off of the Silent Motif Conference of the Poets, followed by Beautiful Wound by Nymphia, and then Mining the American by Chris Olander, followed by Wasteland, again by Nymphia, and then Poppy Manifesto by Sarah Mithra. All right, stay tuned for some more of Dream Dance and Conference of the Poets. This past September, 
I was heading on my bike to the BART station. When I looked up and thought, whoa, what the fuck? As I saw this jumbo jet flying low in my direction with this other plane-like thing attached to the top of it and a couple of fighter jets as escorts. I'm thinking, this is some seriously crazy shit. It turns out that the thing on top of the jumbo jet was the space shuttle Endeavour, which they were parading around our Bay Area airspace as a sort of poster child for the space program before retiring it. The space shuttle, also called an orbiter, was built to replace Challenger, which exploded 73 seconds after its launch in 1986, killing all of its seven crew members. Endeavour traveled over 122 million miles starting in 1992, which included carrying the first African-American woman astronaut, Mae Jemison, into space. Its next stop was to be LA, where after more parading, it went into a museum. Just a month before, in August, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, died at 82. In all, 12 American men walked on the moon, the first in the summer of 1969, when, in a techno marvel of controlled explosion and precision timing, a capsule containing a living human shot outside of Earth's gravity into outer space and landed on the moon. On that luminous, nightly changing ball in the night sky. And looking back toward Earth, seeing it with their own eyes whole for the first time. A deep blue spherical planet. Its patches of brown tinged with green in swirling clouds surrounded by stars the place where they came from, their home, Mother Earth, way out there. About a month later, that same summer of 1969, was the music festival called Woodstock, where America's young people were exploring other spaces. Three years later in 1972, on the last trip taking a man to the moon, a photo was taken of the whole earth that would become the most reproduced image in human history, what some have called the blue marble, like a lovely tender eye floating in the immensity of the cosmos. John F. Kennedy challenging America to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. Through the Civil Rights March on Washington, JFK's assassination, Bob Dylan going electric, the Beatles' first U.S. tour and their last ever concert, the murders of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., the summer of love, the founding of Earth Day and the taking of that iconic photo of the Earth. All that time, we were fighting a war in Vietnam. While Rusty Schweiger, who walked in space, said this about what that view of the Earth made him think. 
hundreds of people killing each other over some imaginary line that you're not even aware of. From where you see it, the thing is a whole, and it's so beautiful, you wish you could take one in each hand, one from each side in the various conflicts, and say, look, look at it from this perspective. Now, what's important? Sometimes I sit on the ground for no reason. My quiet opens and fills me with sky. Brain to Big Bang, I am the blueprint. Marriage of flesh and sapphire. Discovering the opened eye. Carefully, he plucked the yellow cup, crafted its long green stem into a loop, tossed it into the midnight, shining on the lake. I was laughing, knowing I'd never caught the sky with daffodils before. It took a while. A bat dashed by. A frog croaked something ancient. I saw them. 
iridescent silver flashing in the flames. Tails casting a plume of comic dust. And for me, and for me, that was nourishing. You'll find out. Bruno's Gerlach, something wonderful, yet Menace is there. Menace? No, but he's mean, he can be, I've seen him. First, the good part. He left Italy in 1946, and he was already in his early 20s, this Bruno, the Italian who had American know-how and got himself a ranch in Gerlach, then another. Started a country club, cafe, and casino. Had the only gas station around and a motel made with rooms so many it was epic ground floor. His brother worked in Empire, the gypsum town. You have to wait to get Bruno to talk. You don't rush into it. Turns out he had a favorite place at the cafe counter, too. I yielded once the waitress had said so. It was no problem to scoot a little left. She said he was on his way, set in his ways, and 88 years old today. This waitress, the best, a country woman proud of the menu and making sure you got what you wanted. And hearing honey from her wasn't corny. It was good and warm and total hospitality. So soon after the biscuits and gravy and the next 
chapter of Ion Hirsi Ali's memoir, Bruno appeared, smile at the waitress, sat and wordle da 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 until I said, Happy birthday, Bruno, and asked him about the hot springs nearby, just the first topic that came. He said, Burning Man bought it, 300 grand. And, hmm, good, good, he's being good, and good, he has a competitor. Then he jumped to Davenport, California, the cement plant there, a place I knew because of lawsuits brought having to do with dust, as dusty as anything the playa could make. I learned he was going to host some Japanese rocketeers pretty soon. What were they up to? They'd stay in the motel as with the hunters, as everybody pretty much who came. We got to the radio talk show hosted by Bill Wattenberg. He knew him. We touched on the granite range, and I remembered he'd once generously offered his ranch to me for the start of a climb to the top of Granite Peak, a place he called Monte Cassino, and I wondered about that. Monte Cassino, I asked him. See, si, Monte Cassino in Italia. It was somewhat sad when he said it. He had a spread on the western wet side in Squaw Valley, and from Granite Peak summit, the Smoke Creek Desert was magnificently seen, the Black Rock Desert's extension southerly. And Bill Wattenberg had ridden horses there with his dad. They'd come eventually to Bruno's bar, where Bill's dad would say, son, you're only 14, but here's a beer. Stand in the back there and don't let on, or some such instruction. Recall late night, San Francisco's KGO. Bruno had come from Tuscany, but he was born in Pisa. He said Venice was a dirty place, said he raced bicycles once. Some tour, he named the countries. Three gears it was back in the day, three gears only. The art of two dozen yet to come. It was Mussolini's Italy, and his youth was spent in one formation or another in fascist times, and he, he grew into a totalitarian space. Could his occasional temper and ill humor derive from that? Could the unkind comments he sometimes made be some vestige of that gone wrong regime? Till now I've told you the good part, but the rest is different. I remember he was short with the same waitress another time and she'd lapsed into silence after he'd yelled at her and there was cruelty in the way he spoke. What could have earned her such an embarrassing rebuke? Did she not get an order just exactly right? And this day later, while I waited in the air-conditioned bar later, after Bruno's pleasant reminiscence, when our conversation was over and I'd wished him bona fortuna, Bruno entered and approached some men who were drinking. There was business to attend to, receipts, sales, whatever. They worked for him. But he sharply surprised the man. The man said, what's the matter? Tell me the problem. How much trouble am I in? And Bruno simply said, you'll find out. He walked out the door. The guy who displeased him shrugged. What, what'd I do? What's he talking about? But the others couldn't help, for all were equally mystified. The accused drank his beer thoughtfully, and although his companions couldn't say because they were all in the dark, they were at least sympathetic. It was a shared obscurity and confusion. For in all likelihood, each of them had known Bruno's displeasure as well. And probably it was also unearned. You'll find out, Bruno had said in leaving. And when I did the same, I thought I would find out too, but it might take 88 years to learn what mix of mean and thoughtful was the man. And I thought I'd start the study by looking into Monte Cassino. Now I too remember it was a wartime monastery bombed and destroyed in Italia.
But I will scale the walls and I will crack the safe. There's nothing you can love that I can't take away. I'll steal your heart, your heart and put it on a shelf. I know it's yours, but I'll keep it for myself. Your feel just what exactly what I feel. It's numb with pain, and you will never heal. Start the clock. Now obey. Your heart. Start the clock. I'll put now it obey. on my shelf. Start the clock. Now obey. Your heart. Start the clock. I kept my tender heart under shock. A prize. You stole my heart and put it on a shelf. You, stole my you only wanted to you stole my keep it for yourself. You brought me to my knees and left a hole in me. You stole my I've tried to fill it, but you. Hungry sky pours cream into flesh, forms the nascent doorway of me, their eyes, that ground, our heaven, lit beyond time and place, the next body's journey forming in the corona of a comet's tail, like a diamond faceted question mark. Down and to them, I speed and spiral, cascading past an hourglass nebula, the blue eye of God growing with me until I am so small, I become the entire sky. Oh, 
in Omega in single shooting pleasure sculpting my ability to breathe to ride the family helix as it births my wand of light soaring me into that dimension ready to ride the magic carpet of bone as they pull and push me in out in out in out, farther, closer, to where love walks on two legs. And that about rounds out our hour. You heard, in order of appearance, The Space Shuttle by Kirk Lumpkin. Fishing for Stars by Timothy Wooster and Blake Moore. You'll Find Out by Steve Arnston. Heart on a Shelf by Nymphia. And Conceive Me by Blake Moore. You've been listening to Be More Now. And I'm your host, Blake Moore. And here we are, the first Thursday of March, 2023. Hope you had a great time listening to the show. I want to let you know about some shows and some things coming up. Up next is, of course... The Treehouse at 8 p.m. And if this week on The Treehouse, W. Dan will not be interviewing the award-winning author of Anything Important. He will not be speaking with the foremost authority on anything profound. So just be sure and tune into The Treehouse from 8 to 10 tonight for just about anything else. And tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. on Forthright Radio with Joy LeClaire, she's going to be interviewing Dave Truer, author of The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, Native America from 1890 to the present. And again, that's Forthright Radio with Joy LeClaire on Friday morning at 9 a.m. right here on KZYX. And then tomorrow night, Friday, March 3rd, is Pride Nation 101 at 7 p.m. The co-hosts Roland, Corey Medina, and Chad Swimmer will interview direct activist, lawyer, and environmentalist Polly Gervin about her life out of the closet, her years spent furthering indigenous people's rights through legal and direct action channels, and how being a gay woman has helped to shape her into the powerhouse that she is now. They'll also get an update from Tanda Blue Bear of Women with Bo about their journey last fall to help the elders at Wounded Knee. Again, that's Pride Nation 101, and that's this Friday at 7 p.m., also right here on KZYX and Z. And I'll let you know about a live event this coming Saturday night, March 4th, at the Arena Theater. We've got Alex y los Tres Letras, and that's a Cumbia Banda Romantica show that starts at 7.30 p.m., And more information on that show can be found at thearenatheater.org. And that's the Arena Theater in Point Arena. And that about wraps up our show. Uh, Have a beautiful evening. Thank you so much for listening. This is Blake Moore on KZWX saying goodnight.